Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Six Pack family. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 102. A big part of this episode deals with my congratulations to the Supreme Court. I'll explain later why I'm offering them my congratulations, but first I want to talk about something President Trump said earlier this month that will lead right into my congratulations. President Trump made what was perhaps the truest statement he's ever made when he said conservatives and Republicans are too nice. That applies to Catholic lay people of every stripe across the theological spectrum as well. We're just too damn nice, and that's got to change. Have you heard? A brand new translation of the Holy Bible is available for Catholics. Introducing the English Standard Version Catholic Edition, the most beautiful and readable Catholic translation of the Bible. If you've ever had difficulty reading the Bible or are looking for the perfect gift this holiday season, this is the Bible for you. The new translation includes changes to nearly 60,000 words from the Revised Standard Version and is the best combination of a literal translation written in smooth and readable English. Available in bonded leather, hardcover or softcover, the ESV Catholic Edition is a Bible you will love and a translation you can trust. To learn more about the ESV Catholic Edition or to purchase your copy, visit catholicbible.org. Again, that's www.catholicbible.org. Conservatives are too nice. We play by the rules and expect things to turn out right because we view the world that way. But the left doesn't play by the rules and that's why they win more often than not. For Catholics, being nice not only works to our detriment politically, pro-life efforts for example, but it also works to our detriment in the Catholic Church in America and around the world. For whatever reason, Catholics think they have to be nicer than Jesus. But the word nice isn't even in the Bible. There was nothing nice about Jesus by today's standards of what we call nice. In Luke 12, 51 through 53, Jesus said, Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. In other words, Jesus is plainly stating that truth will be divisive to the degree that it can destroy our most personal relationships. Since he's the very embodiment of truth and said so in John 14, 6, and since he commands us throughout the Gospels to be willing to die to promote and defend truth, we're dead wrong to be nice, or at least nicer than Jesus. You might say, but Joe, Jesus said we have to love everyone. That's absolutely correct. But where in Scripture does it say that love equates to being nice? Jesus certainly loved everyone, as he demonstrated all throughout the Gospels, but there wasn't anything nice about him either. Jesus publicly called men liars, hypocrites, and white-painted sepulchers full of dead men's bones. He drove people from the temple with a whip. What part of any of that is nice? These examples of Jesus not being nice causes some people to be in conflict because they see a contradiction between the things Jesus taught and the things he did. But there's really no contradiction at all. Let me ask you, what's the very most important thing anyone possesses? Well, it's their soul, of course. When you see close friends or family members doing things or about to do things that are potentially self-destructive, what do you do? You say things they don't want to hear, things that hurt or anger them. Why? Because you love them, so you tell them the truth in an attempt to try to save them, whether they like it or not. That's genuine love. If you react that way when it's close friends and family members, why won't you do it for everyone? 
Jesus commanded us to love everyone. Either we believe him or we don't. Either we obey him or we won't. The same hurtful truths we tell friends or family who are messing up has to be applied equally to everyone we meet, or we're being disobedient to Christ at best, hypocritical at worst. If we look at the commandments of Jesus where he tells us to love everyone, we have to look at all of what we're to love in toto. Certainly we have to love Christ's mystical body, which is the church. In fact, we have to love it so much that when greaseball politician bishops or disloyal lavender mafia priests betray the lay faithful, we have to stand up to them, both privately and publicly, and demand the orthodoxy that is our right, no matter the cost to us individually or collectively. Defending truth, that is, defending Jesus, is that important. Defending Jesus and his teachings against Marxist bishops and Judas-type priests is our duty and obligation, but it comes with a price. It's a good price because Jesus said, He who does not pick up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Our failure to defend truth will cost us our immortal souls. That's not me saying it, but rather Jesus. And before I continue with the other things that we're obligated to love, I want to make a couple of comments all of you need to hear. Last week, a listener sent me an email thanking me for telling it like it is. One thing she said was that I speak my mind. I got to thinking about that and decided I've been remiss in telling you something you need to take to heart. And I thank that listener for making me think about this. When I'm expressing my opinion, speaking my mind, I'll always let you know it's just that, my opinion. If I don't tell you something is my opinion, then it's absolute Catholic orthodoxy, or it's derived from the constant 2,000-year teaching of the Catholic Church. I'm so convinced of any truth I tell you on this show or any of my written work that if you think I'm wrong, I'll happily debate you on this show any time on any topic I've covered. And that debate invitation includes bishops and priests. But I realize that's a waste of time because any of them who disagree with me are too cowardly to debate me. That's how convinced I am that anything I teach is the truth. If I tell you it's raining beer, you better grab your mug and run outside. Back to the things we're obligated to love. One of the things Jesus obligates us to love people through is the virtue of patriotism. Patriotism really does encompass loving everyone in the truest sense, at least everyone in our country. Patriotism, by its very nature, insists that we love our country. America isn't just a place. It isn't just a geographical area defined by borders. America, above all else, is the people who rightfully and legally claim citizenship. So if you love your country, if you're patriotic, you love the American people. Being a patriot doesn't mean you have to love your government, but that you love the people. I hate our nation's government with every fiber of my being, but if you've listened to this show for any length of time, then you know I love the United States of America. Things weren't good in America back in the 70s when I served in the military. Compared to today, though, America had no problems at all back then. Today, the Marxists and extreme socialists are trying to take over this country through Black Lives Matter, Antifa, and the Demonic Democratic Party. If they succeed, enslavement becomes our destiny. If you're a patriot, and all Catholics are required to be patriots, then we can't let that happen. Last week, my Catholic News Notes segment, I included an article from LifeSite News titled, When Should a People Overthrow Its Government? After the author listed a long but partial list of tyrannical policies a new Biden administration would inflict on us, he wrote this, quote, In short, there is a point at which citizens are justified in rejecting duly appointed leaders. The Declaration of Independence unequivocally states that there is such a point. To wit, when any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute new government. After which comes the qualifier, 
Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. However, when a long train of abuses and usurpations, events are designed to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Two sentences later, the Declaration reiterates the right to alter government when its leaders are usurping the rights of the people and attempting to establish absolute tyranny, end quote. Then the author asks the obvious question about whether or not we've reached that stage of absolute tyranny. He answers his own question by saying that we haven't yet. I agree that as long as Trump is president, we don't have absolute tyranny. However, we already know from the left statements and actions that we'll lose freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and our right to bear arms. They're also going to expand the culture of death in that they're now advocating that a certain percentage of people under the age of two and over the age of 80 need to be eliminated. Incidentally, you'll notice that the lamestream media aren't talking about this because the American people will never accept it. This is only my opinion, but I think that we'll be in a de facto state of absolute tyranny if Joe Biden becomes president. Therefore, in my opinion, upon Biden's inauguration, we not only can, but should revolt. Jefferson said, when tyranny becomes law, rebellion becomes duty. He was merely echoing what he said in the Declaration of Independence. If Biden wins his illegitimate presidency, which alone is enough to justify rebellion, this isn't the time for being nice. Just as our forefathers did in 1776, we have to be prepared to defend our own lives, liberties, and pursuit of happiness, all of which are given to us by God himself and not the government. You may ask, Joe, are you talking about the possibility of war? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. The reason I'm congratulating the United States Supreme Court is because last Friday they gave every American patriot a reason to begin a second civil war when seven of the justices rejected the Texas suit against the four battleground states of Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Rush Limbaugh, who I've never known to be wrong about our society or culture, said he believes the conservative states are tending towards secession. Right this moment, 71% of Americans believe a new civil war is inevitable. I'm one of those Americans. It's time to fight. But Joe, I don't believe in violence, you might say. For starters, fighting to preserve liberty isn't violence. It's not called violence, but rather force. It's force when you shoot an unjust aggressor who's trying to hurt you or your family, not violence. And to say you don't believe in violence, when you actually mean the use of force, is to imply two things. The first thing that it implies is an adherence to pacifism. Pacifism is a heresy that's been rejected by the church from the very first century, so trying to wiggle out a conflict on the basis of pacifism puts you squarely outside the church. Any Catholic adhering to pacifism must either reconcile himself to the church or simply stop calling himself Catholic. The second thing implied is cowardice. As a veteran, I can attest firsthand to the fact that freedom isn't free. Well, few freedoms we have left are there because 1% of the American people have been willing to sacrifice everything for the other 99% so you could have those freedoms. Comfort and conviction don't live on the same block. How many times have you heard me say that? If you prize your comfort more than your convictions, you've selfishly told everyone else that you really have no convictions at all for anything greater than yourself. Conviction for anything, by necessity, carries with it self-sacrifice, even the possibility of the sacrifice of life. It doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have to sacrifice your life, but it does mean that there will definitely be other great personal sacrifices for any conviction you hold. Claiming to hold conviction sounds good, but you have to be willing to put your money where your mouth is. I have a great deal of concern for the future of this country. 
If the current state of affairs had been present even 50 years ago, people would be in the streets demanding change in the heads of their elected officials. But Americans' response to the pandemic lockdowns with puppy dog compliance tells me they might not any longer be willing to fight for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We've had it too good in America for far too long. We've allowed demonic Democrats to drive God from our society, and doing that created a vacuum that's been filled with a worship of self. That's made us a nation of wimps who cower down and avoid living our lives under the guise of saving our lives. I've got news for you. Life not lived isn't life at all. If you're hunkering down and not living your life, you may as well call the funeral home and tell them to come pick you up. My fellow veterans will understand what I'm about to say. When I swore the oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic, nobody ever told me that oath had an expiration date. Like most veterans, I still feel obligated to fulfill that oath. My honorable discharge from the Army wasn't a discharge of my responsibilities. It's way past time to get back to living, because now it's time to be prepared to fight for our God-given liberties. Bad Catholic Joe Biden and that Marxist woman who will act as vice president are going to work with their fellow satanic Democrat child murderers to advance the depopulation of America with even more officially sanctioned legal murder, strip us of our God-given freedom to worship, abolish our God-given right to defend ourselves, rob us of our God-given right to assemble and speak our minds, and sell out America to communist China. You're also going to see gas prices skyrocket to $10 a gallon or more, and you're going to be told how much water and electricity you can use. Tyranny is going to be a hallmark of life in these United States from now on. They began getting us used to it with the foolish and wholly unnecessary pandemic lockdowns. Effective January 20th, they're going to force their control over our lives, and the America you've known all your life will be gone forever, nothing more than a happy memory. The question is this, are you going to be as spineless as the jellyfish we call our nation's bishops, or are you going to revive the spirit of our forefathers, the spirit of 1776? Are you going to hunker down like a sniveling coward, or are you going to stand up and fight for yourselves and your posterity? Are you going to defend your liberties, or are you going to idly sit back and let these very evil people enslave you? Frankly, I'd rather die. So you have a choice and decision to make. Are you going to be true to your convictions and principles, or are you going to be a coward? Well, I guess we'll find out soon enough. Do you have an apostolate you'd like other Catholics to learn about? Maybe you have an e-commerce business and you want to build sales while supporting a Holy Orthodox apostolate. Whatever you want to advertise, The Cantankerous Catholic is your portal to success. The Cantankerous Catholic isn't even a year into broadcasting its weekly shows and we're already listened to in 16 countries, all 50 states, and 101 major cities throughout the U.S. and Canada. Our listener demographics are the most sought after for advertisers. The Cantankerous Catholic avatar is 53% men and 47% women ages 18 to 34. The show's average growth rate through 2019 was 24% per week, and our listeners are Orthodox Catholics who reject heterodox Catholic positions and political correctness. Relative to other broadcasts and online advertising, our rates are extremely cost-effective and inexpensive. You can advertise in each show's show notes, in the recorded episode itself, our weekly newsletter that announces each new episode, all of these media together, or in any combination. So contact us today by filling out the form on the Sponsor Kit page at cantankerouscatholic.com or email Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, directly at joe at cantankerouscatholic.com to learn how you can begin driving traffic to whatever you want to promote while helping to support a worthy, orthodox, and hard-hitting apostolate.
Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, wants to make sure you're informed about all the Catholic news you need to know. Here's Joe Sixpack's top five Catholic news picks for this episode. Catholic news pick number five. Hats off to Catholic vote for a video. Now Governor Northam of Virginia is telling us how to worship. This is the same governor who is a physician who wants to murder babies after they're born and call it post-birth abortion. That jerk. That just makes me mad! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic News Pick number 4 Hats off to Fox News. President Trump secured a peace deal between Israel and Morocco, which becomes the fourth Muslim country in the last four months, to normalize ties with Israel. Our two great friends, Israel and the Kingdom of Morocco, have agreed to full diplomatic relations, a massive breakthrough for peace in the Middle East, President Trump tweeted. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic News Pick number, number three. Hats off to the Washington Examiner. Colorado Governor Jared Polis said that the Supreme Court's decision in the New York case prompted him to drop coronavirus restrictions on houses of worship. That's what I'm talking about. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic News, News Pick, Pick number, number two. two. Hats off to LifeSite News. In an otherwise successful cycle for conservatives at the state level, American voters elected seven men who claimed to be women as state legislators. <laughs> you can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic News, News Pick, Pick number one. one. Hats off to LifeSite News. The Centers for Disease Control plans to track coronavirus vaccine recipients through a smartphone app and send them daily text messages the week after they're injected. The CDC will then contact them weekly for six weeks, the Wall Street Journal reported. More Orwellian garbage. Despicable! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. but I am fair. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. John was lying in a hospital bed, paralyzed and in a coma. His lips couldn't move, his eyes couldn't blink, and not a part of his body could move in protest when he heard doctors saying to each other, he's gone, nothing more can be done for him. John had been given up for dead. He heard all this in terror, yet couldn't show that he was still alive. A priest came in. Called too late, the doctors told him. But the priest, true to his seminary training and the church's teaching, ignored the doctors and went on with giving the man the last rites. He administered conditional absolution and the anointing of the sick, just in case there was the least amount of life left in the man. John recovered, and everyone said it was a miracle. John later told the priest how much he felt the strength-giving, life-giving powers of the last sacrament, and how happy he was to note the church carries on for you even after the world and medical science give up. The anointing of the sick, also called extreme unction, is the sacrament instituted by Christ which gives spiritual health and sometimes, within the providential will of God, physical healing to persons who are in danger of death due to serious illness, injury, or old age. The scriptural basis for this sacrament is found both in the Gospels and James. Jesus showed it through his powers to bring back those who were already apparently dead, such as in the case of Lazarus and the daughter of Jairus, as well as many others he brought back from the brink of death. 
the sacraments use is found in James 5, 14 and 15, which says, Is any among you sick? Let him call the elders, that would be priests, of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the sick man, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. We also see in the Gospels where Christ sends his apostles and other male disciples to perform this act while preaching. The anointing of the sick increases sanctifying grace. It also allows the sick person the grace of uniting himself more closely to Christ's passion, giving suffering a new meaning. The anointing of the sick, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, strengthens against the temptation to discouragement and anguish in the face of death, removes temporal punishment due to sin, removes venial sin, and leads the sick person to healing of the soul, but also of the body, if such is God's will. The anointing of the sick is a sacrament of reconciliation in that it remits venial sins. Also, if the sick person is unable to make a good confession prior to receiving the sacrament, for example in a coma, delirium, or paralysis, it'll remit mortal sins as well, provided the sick person has at least imperfect contrition. If the sick person regains his health, he's obligated to make a good confession if he wasn't in the state of grace prior to receiving the sacrament. Jesus tries right up to the final moment to draw us to him. He called Judas his friend, even while the man was in the act of betraying him, in order to call the traitor back to him. From the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He wasn't in a state of despair, which would be a mortal sin. No, he was trying to get the Pharisees to remember Psalm 22, which predicted the Messiah would go through exactly what he was going through at that moment. Jesus calls us to himself right to the bitter end, and that's precisely what the anointing of the sick is all about, giving us one last chance to be reconciled to him before we stand in his presence to be judged. Of course, that doesn't mean you're guaranteed to be able to receive the sacrament, so I wouldn't count on it if I were you. Even when someone is already apparently dead, we should still call a priest to administer the anointing of the sick. The theological definition of death is when the soul separates from the body. Just because there aren't any brain waves, heartbeat, or respiratory activity doesn't mean the soul has left the body. The church teaches her priests that the soul may linger in the body for quite some time, and she insists that priests should administer the sacrament for up to eight hours after apparent death. St. Anthony of Padua was at his friary in Italy when he learned that his father was on trial for the murder of a young nobleman found slain on his father's property in Portugal. St. Anthony told his brother friars he'd return soon. As he exited the friary door in Italy, he entered the courtroom in Portugal. Recognizing the famous Franciscan priest, the judge stopped the proceedings to welcome St. Anthony. The saint used that break to address the court. I can prove my father didn't commit this murder. If the court please, we will have the deceased himself tell you. The judge reluctantly agreed and court was reconvened at the cemetery after the coffin of the slain man was exhumed. When the crowd gathered around, St. Anthony commanded the lid to be removed from the coffin. Then he cried out, I abjure you, in the name of Jesus Christ, tell us whether my father killed you. To the astonishment of the crowd, the young man sat up in his coffin. He answered the saint, No, Father Anthony, your father did not kill me. Father, I died without having the benefit of making a good confession. Will you hear my confession? St. Anthony knelt by the coffin while the crowd backed up a little further. As the saint granted absolution, the man's body fell back into the coffin. The point of this true story is to show you how the body may appear dead, but the soul can still be present. There are many other events in the church's history to demonstrate this as well, but this one event should suffice. So even if someone appears already to be dead, call the priest anyway. And I'd recommend that you tell your loved ones now to do the same for you if death is sudden, and it almost always is. 
By the way, this sacrament can be received more than once by someone in danger of death if his condition worsens or if he gets better and suffers a relapse. The elderly, whether sick or in good health, may receive the anointing of the sick at regular intervals. Talk to your priest and don't worry about bothering him because his primary purpose in the priesthood is to bring you the sacraments, all of them. Something I recently learned from a friend of mine, Joseph Silver, is something I think is worth talking about. Joseph is a young man who recently found God calling him to a vocation as a monk at Clear Creek Abbey. Clear Creek is a Benedictine Abbey in the Ozark Mountains of eastern Oklahoma. I've been there many times for retreat and with my friend Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke. It's very traditional and true to the rule of St. Benedict. When you go to Clear Creek, you feel like you've gone back a thousand years in time. There's no radio, no television, no internet. It's a great place. Joseph is all set up to begin his novitiate, but there's one problem, and he needs your help. Before he's able to enter, Father Abbott requires him, just as all orders do, to pay off his student loans, and we all know what those loans are like. Joseph's been visiting parish churches all over the place to speak after Sunday Mass in order to ask his fellow Catholics for help. He's been getting some good help from parishioners, but visiting parishes to pay off his debt could take years. I think the six-pack family can help Joseph, though. Doing that's easy. There seems to be a group I'd never heard of called the Laboré Society. It's dedicated to helping young men and women pay off loans so they can be free to pursue their vocation. Since I'd never heard of the Laboré Society, I contacted my friend the Father Abbot of Clear Creek to verify it's okay. Well, it's most certainly okay. If you want to help Joseph to be able to pursue his vocation, visit the link for it in my show notes today. You'll get a chance to meet Joseph through a video there. I'll also put a link to Clear Creek Abbey in my show notes. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. Rose of Lima. She said, Apart from the cross, there is no other ladder by which we may get to heaven. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. Two men sat together on a train, one gray-haired and thoughtful, the other young, restless, and worried. The elderly man said, I think you're in trouble. Can I help in any way? No, sir, the young man said. No one can help me. But after a little while, he said, But you're a stranger, and I'll never see you again. I think I can trust you, and it'll be a relief to tell my story. It was a sad story. He'd stolen to help his widowed mother. Then he'd fallen into bad company with two older men. The three had attempted a big burglary. The night watchman had surprised them and had been shot by one of the older men who were captured by the police. They blamed the murder on the young man who'd managed to get away, and now there was a warrant for his arrest. He was on the train to flee to another city to hide. The old gentleman looked serious but spoke kindly. I strongly advise you to turn yourself in and tell your whole story in court, just as you've told it to me. You're very kind. It was very easy to tell you, but I'd be afraid in court. But finally, the young man promised to give himself up. In the crowded courtroom, the youth was brought to stand trial. He was asked to make his statement. He was so afraid that he could hardly speak. He raised his eyes to the judge and was both surprised and relieved because the judge turned out to be the friend he'd found on the train. It was easy to tell his story now to someone who already knew it. He was acquitted of murder and placed on probation for the burglary. He never got into trouble again. One day Jesus will be your judge. Nothing can be hidden from him. 
You'll feel the same confidence young men felt whenever you stand before Jesus, but only if you've let him be your friend in this life, especially if you've gone to confession regularly and told him your sins. Remember your upcoming judgment, and you'll keep away from sin. Be sorry for your sins and do penance for them now, so you can have the kind judge at your judgment. Every Catholic needs to be listening to the Cantankerous Catholic, because this show will help you to learn to navigate through these tumultuous times, as well as learn, understand, and live our Catholic faith better. You can help other Catholics find the Cantankerous Catholic much easier by leaving a review of this show at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Reviews cause the podcasting platforms to show the Cantankerous Catholic more often. And I thank you in advance for leaving a review. This has been the Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.